It's not too early in the morning, right? How many, how many folks are local, like are in London? Okay, yeah, fair number. And elsewhere in, in the UK? Well, you know, while well, still the UK? All right, so mostly UK folks here. Uh, I am not from the UK. My name is Richard Campbell. Uh, I, I'm, I come from one of the colonies. I'm from Canada, west coast uh, of Canada. This is actually a camera that points in between my yard and my neighbor's yard. My place on the left uh, and on the right is my neighbor's place. Uh, we call this camera the Animal Highway for a reason. Uh, it's about six in the morning on a Wednesday. And Wednesday is garbage day in my neighborhood. <laughs> So this guy tends to roll out. I didn't know until I put the camera in. He comes out every Wednesday just to see if I put up my garbage early. He's very precise. He knows exactly what he's doing. And uh, yeah, you guys have bears roll through your neighborhoods here? No, no, it's foxes, right? I've seen foxes around here, but yeah, not so many bears. So yeah, we're on a green belt and they live here. And it's, I, I hate to say it, but it's kind of normal for us. Uh, yeah, and I show that to the Australians, they freak out. It's like, you have everything that kills you, the bear bothers you. Okay. They're, as soon as the bear sees you, it buggers off. It only wants garbage, right? In fact, that particular bear is a male lives in the area. He's a good bear. If you do put your garbage out early, he just opens the can, takes the bag, and takes it into the ravine. He doesn't make a mess in your yard. Right? So basically, the bear takes your garbage out for you. I mean, that is a good bear. Uh, I've been a programmer for a long time. I actually wrote my first line of code in 1977, which is not important at all. The important thing that happened in 1977 is Star Wars, right? Priorities. Uh, and that line of code was written on a TRS-80 Model 1 with uh, 4K of RAM and a version of BASIC not made by Microsoft. It was a tiny BASIC, and it only had three error messages. What? How? and sorry, <laughs> which I still think is the best error message ever, because at least it's honest, right? I mean, what is object not found, but sorry. Uh, so I've done a lot of things in programming over the years, and I ultimately ended up working, making podcasts. Any Donna Rock listeners? Oh, wow, awesome, okay. So my friend Carl Franklin, who's here, he's back in the booth, we're gonna be recording later on today, started Donna Rocks back in 2002, which is a couple of years before the word uh, podcast even existed. I came on board as a co-host in uh, 2005, episode 100, and we published, what, 1622? 1620. Uh, twice a week, free to download. We talk to smart people all the time. A lot of the folks that you see here at this conference are guests on our shows. I also make an IT show called Runners Radio, which I've been doing every Wednesday since April 11th, 2007. And for a brief period, we did a show called The Tablet Show for about three years back when we weren't quite sure how much .NET rocked anymore. And so that was sort of our hedge about iOS and Android in that whole weird Win8 time. But by 2014, it became apparent that .NET still rocked, and we rolled that into the main show, and the rest is kind of history. But we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about web, but you first have to talk about the internet. And this is actually a ping map of IP addresses around the world showing where those concentrations of IP addresses are. So the internet existed independently of the web. I just have to remind ourselves of that, that the internet was first. It was this infrastructure started by the Americans that eventually spread around the world, largely through universities. And it was for uh, flexible communication systems all over the place. And then this fine fellow by the name of Tim Berners-Lee, and that's a period accurate photograph of him from 1989, who's actually a software developer like us, working for CERN in Geneva. And he had this idea that it was too hard to share and connect scientific papers via the internet. This is in a time of Gopher and Archie and FTP, and it was just tricky to do any of those things. And wouldn't it be nice to have a hyper-text or hyper-linking protocol that will allow us to have view documents and to share their footnotes and to create a web of connections between them. And he wrote that on a, uh, a Next computer. This was Jobs' idea after he got kicked out of Apple, was to say, you know, the Mac wasn't expensive enough. Let's make a really expensive computer. So expensive that a magnesium case doesn't seem ridiculous. Although the core of the, the Next ultimately would be what would eventually be known as Mac OS, right, OS X. Uh, this is actually a photograph of Tim Berners-Lee's computer. It has a sticker on it. There's the close-up of the sticker. 
because this was the first web server ever, and since it was actually a desktop workstation, the staff kept turning it off at night to save power, which is not good for a server. Um, and that's the very first web page ever made. You'll notice no porn. Porn comes later. Not much later, but later. Uh, as Tim's vaguely upset with what's happened to the World Wide Web. He's disappointed in all of us, really. Uh, the, it's hard. It, what I love about the story is just the, the directions that it went in, like how unexpected so many of the things that have happened over the past few years have been. And, and you've been in this long enough, you sort of get to, you rode this in your own view, and as I've sort of assembled notes around all this, you just see this broader and broader view of, of, of a kind of the madness. Uh, the web took off largely around the supercomputing center in Illinois, Urbana. Uh, and this is, their, this is a modern logo, so it looks cool. This is the 80s logo. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's where uh, a group of folks were working uh, using the web when it was very much in a, a pure academic exercise, moving information back and forth. And this is the place where in 93, they were starting to do their first levels of programming with the common gateway interface, CGI, uh, largely coded in C. And most of the viewing tools were text-based. Everything was kind of text-based then. Until uh, the, the folks there, including a fellow by the name of Mark Andreessen, started tinkering with Mosaic. Recognize the logo? Like, it's literally a ripoff of the university logo. Right? They, they, they really weren't all that original thinking. Uh, and they did make some Windows versions of it. So this is 94, those sort of first incarnations. And by the fall of 94, they spin off a new company. The company is called Mosaic communications, and they, that's when the university kind of said, a little too on the point, guys, to literally use the product name that you made in the university as your company name, so they changed the name to Netscape. And again, the internet is quite private, it's still very much inside of the university space, and you, you advertise then on message boards and on IRC, and so they shipped their .9 edition of Netscape Communicator in October of 94, literally just by posting it on a news group saying, hey, we've made this graphical browser, it runs in Windows, here's the bits you need. There are only 20 million people on the internet at this point, right? It's only so big, but within a couple of weeks, about five million of them are already running this browser. So it was a small community, but it adapted very quickly. By the following year, by 95, half of all HTTP requests in the world are now being done by a Netscape browser. And they invented a lot of core technology. They implemented the first stack that we would eventually call SSL, the TLS stack. That's Netscape. And these, they were doing all these very fundamental things. But 95 is important for another reason, because 95 is when the US government says, OK, we're going to allow commerce. We're going to take NSFNet away. We're going to move a bunch of our academic stuff off of this network and, pro and keep it as separate. And we're going to allow uh, commerce and the new set of rules around IANA for uh, commercialization to be legal. And this is in 95, this is April of 95. This, this is when AOL, who'd been AOL and CompuServe and Genie and all of these third party network services all now provided gateways to the internet. It was the new thing. And so you would log in. My, my CompuServe account was 102.055.1500. It is sad that that is still in my head, <laughs> but it is. It's 25 years, still in my head. And so you'd log in with that account, and then you could use the gateway to get on the internet. There wasn't a lot there, but it was the beginning. And what was there was not pretty. You know, we were trying to find stuff. Uh, this is at the era of GeoCities. This is IE3 on Windows 95, which for a lot of folks was their first view of the internet if you didn't actually download a copy of Netscape, which you had to FTP because you didn't have a browser. Uh, but this is also what Microsoft catches on to, my, uh, when Bill Gates writes his internet tidal wave letter where he says, look, the internet's going to be a thing. And Microsoft didn't believe the internet was going to be a thing. You have to think about what the internet looked like in, those, in the early 90s. This was a place for Unix geeks who liked to type text-based commands to communicate with each other. It didn't look like a commercial product. It didn't look like something that regular humans would ever be interested in. Microsoft was actually betting heavily on, on, on interactive television because what consumers liked was television. 
was the chirons and the graphics and the music and the animation that came with television. That looked more like a consumer product. That's how we should do this information superhighway, as opposed to the back-end plumbing that was TCP IP and HTTP that we could gradually advance the machines to serve this well. So we took a technology that was not intended for this commercial purpose and sort of morphed it into it, but Bill caught on by May 95, and one thing you can say in favor of Bill Gates is the whole company goes whichever way he points, and when he said, all right, everybody, the internet's a thing and we're gonna get on board, everybody do something internet related. And every team had to do something internet related. Many of those things were not good. Like SQL Server 95 had an output to, HTTP, to HTML format built in by 96. I'm not saying it was a good idea. It's just that that was the power that Bill had to make every one of those teams do these things. And we're right at the beginning of HTML. There's, you know, tables are new. The original specifications for HTML that, that Tim Berners-Lee produced didn't even have images in it. It was the Netscape guys who added images and upset him because he knew that would lead to porn. Uh, and tables, you know, the beginning of formatting, this is still, there's no real standards. Everybody's building their own thing. In a lot of ways, Netscape was setting the standards simply by getting new versions of the browser out the door with these new capabilities, and the IE teams and the Opera teams just followed along for quite a while. Now, on the back end, we were programming in fun languages like Perl. You know, they, they begin, these are the origins of the write once, read never languages. It's like, you know what I need in my life? More punctuation. We could do this. But that's what backends look like. This was actually a sophisticated language rather than programming in C against the CGI that you could use Perl, you could use Python. Early versions of Python existed back then too. But I think, you know, we're at the spring of 95. By the fall of 95, we have Netscape's IPO and the beginning of what we'd eventually call the dot-com boom. And it's... It's, again, tricky to remember. This is, the, the, this is Octo August of 95. Before this, IPOs were for large companies that had ideas so big that you needed public funding. Nobody had enough money to fund this idea. They needed a huge amount of infrastructure. We, needed to, we had to build ships or build buildings. Like There's extraordinary things you need to build, and so you publicly funded to make it possible. Now, there had been an IPO before Netscape that had been a true tech IPO, and it was Microsoft's IPO. And so, and it had rocketed up in value. And so the folks that were into trading stocks in 95, which is, you know, not that hip a thing, they didn't want to miss this one. And so, while it had been initially priced at $14, they changed the pricing to $28 a share on the release date, although it actually didn't wasn't available to be trading right as the market opened. So many orders came in, it broke the queues. And so it wasn't until nearly noon that they executed the first trade on a Netscape stock, which had opened at $28. That was the initial offer. The first trade was at $71. So you just want to get, and nobody had ever seen anything like this, right? This company had only been in existence for a little over a year. It had only had revenues of about $17 million, and here it had this three times on the first trade. By the end of the first day of trading, the market capitalization for 30% of the stock, which is all that was available to trade, was $2 billion. Right? This is the original unicorn before we even know to call them unicorns. So there's a reason that we went insane. These numbers were kind of unprecedented. By the end of 95, Netscape will be trading at $171 a share. And Mark Andreessen is on the cover of Time, not wearing any shoes, because apparently that's a thing. And they're literally comparing him to Steve Jobs at that point. And the dot-com boom is set off. And it, I mean, part of this is this is the first time that the investment community was exposed to Moore's Law, not based in hardware. As long as there were hardware requirements, you had these huge amounts of overhead, and so there was big investments and big fixed values. You knew how much the building cost, how much the, the equipment cost, and so forth. But here was a software-based company that could ship a new product every week via the internet. 
So all of those cost structures that existed for companies before, they were blown apart. We absolutely take this for granted today, but this was the first time. This was the first time we really communicated to the business world that we can create value that has virtually zero cost of shift, that is only mental energy to, to actually create. And every time there's a problem or a complaint with a product, we fix it and do the next one. And they lost their minds and just started shoveling money at us. And so we spent it all. <laughs> uh, other technologies that come along this time, this is when we start building out the first web servers. And I, I lift up, list Apache and Internet Information Server side by side. They shipped within a few months of each other, although Apache definitely existed first. But Apache was never really a product. It was literally a set of libraries that you assembled in Unix to run what would be called a web server. And it's called Apache server, not for the indigenous tribes in North America, but the fact that it was literally a set of patches you put together to become a server. It was a patchy server, because Unix people are funny. And Microsoft with IIS, you know, made it as an add-on to NT351. This was the NT team's response to the internet tidal wave letter that Bill put out. It's like, make us a web server. And both these products suffer from the same problem because they come from the same era, which is to say they're like Swiss Army knives with all the blades turned out. Like, I don't know what you're going to need to make this work, but I have it for you, and it's on. And so we could try and experiment with these things, right? We were all learning at that time. That's why they were, they were, they were like that. This would come to bite us later as we evolve and get smarter and figure out that surface area matters and there are overheads. But at the time, this was serving us as best it could. Other very early languages. Uh, Cold Fusion actually starts right at the very beginning. Hilaire, a company in, in, in the United States, uh, prints up the first version. And like many products of the early web, this will ultimately be bought by uh, Macromedia or Adobe, or in this case, it was bought by Macromedia that was then by, uh, bought by Adobe. And that'll be a recurring theme if you look at the early history of the internet, that eventually every good piece of software goes to die at Adobe. Uh, did I say that loud? That's not right. Uh, PHP, which actually stands for personal homepage. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's the beginning of the internet, right? So Rasmus Lerdorf was writing CGI apps in C, and he literally assembled a set of tools to make it easier for him to build web pages, and he shared it with some folks. He didn't know how to write a language. He's the first one to tell you he didn't know how to write a language. And language people look at it and go, you clearly didn't know how to write a language. Uh, these days, they now, it's now the proper recursive uh, name, PHP Access stands for PHP Hypertext Processor. Because right, that's you know how we do things, and other people have taken over and advanced it in its own way. But PHP, PHP has origins in the very beginning of all these things. The bigger companies come along a little later. So Sun Microsystems, Microsoft, really 95, 96 is where they start. They've been working on new languages and new tools to be able to take our existing developers and, and be able to insert them into the internet in one form or another. Java actually has its origins as a project called Oak that was meant for set-top boxes because Sun, like Microsoft, thought interactive TV is going to be the way. We need a programming language for interactive TV. And then when the internet takes off, right in that same time, it's like, or we'll make it run on the internet. How about that? And by the end of 95, we have Brendan Eich prototyping together, working for Netscape, a thing that they would initially call Mocha which was also a bad name, but JavaScript truly the worst name ever, ever, right? Like just sat down and said, if you really wanted to confuse an entire industry, what would you name this product? And so, yeah, it's not Java, and it's not really a scripting language. Let's call it JavaScript. <laughs> uh, although initially it was called LiveScript. And so now we start to have some ingredients. We have a set of tools, we have a set of services. Let's let regular developers start to build code. And Linux is ascending out of the Unix wave, and so we start getting stacks like the LAMP stack. Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Although if you don't like PHP, you can work right in Perl, which I don't know if you're better off. Uh, or, and same with MySQL could also be Mongo, although Mongo comes along substantially ever. Don't like Linux? All right. Do it with Windows. Now it's WAMP. Don't like Windows? All right. Do it with Mac OS. Now it's MAMP. I don't know if any of them are better. Higher level languages start to come along within the next year or two. 
So the folks from Macromedia uh, with a, a tool called Shockwave, separately, there was a group that was building a thing they were going to call Flash. They first called Future Splash. And they, uh, Macromedia ended up merging all those together in the late 90s to become what would become Flash. And then by 2005, Adobe buys them for pennies on the dollar. And someday it'll go away. Uh, well, let's, let's be honest about Flash, which is fully deprecated by 2020 now. They're finally we're going to let it go because nobody needs that many memory leaks. Uh, other technologies, maybe not as fondly remembered. And we all wanted a WYSIWYG way, you know, a, a graphical way to draw web pages. And so Vermeer is actually a company out of Massachusetts, the United States, uh, that was prototyping this tool first, built the first couple of versions. Microsoft buys them in 97, and I think they, they last till maybe 2000. Uh, it's just, you know, horrible code. Uh, more fondly remembered, but I wonder if it's a delusion, is, is Dreamweaver. Any Dreamweaver fans? And, and this is the thing is, I, I think our memories are fooling us. It's like Kentucky Fried Chicken. Like when you, your childhood memories of Kentucky Fried Chicken are awesome. Have you had it lately? It's really not that good. In 1998, Dreamweaver was amazing. It's 2019. It's really not that good. <laughs> anyway, let's, so more, more importantly, don't try it again. Enjoy those memories. Right? Remember it fondly and do something else. Uh, Microsoft tries to consolidate all of their expansive set of dev tools in 97 into a thing called Studio. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a ruse because they, I mean, C++ is one of their principal products and it has its own IDE and Visual Basic is an important product and it has its own IDE and Fox Pro they acquired and it has its own IDE. And so they're like, let's put it all in the box. And so now you had actually four IDEs in the box. They, they wouldn't actually unify it until .NET. Uh, but Microsoft also made a version of Java called J++ and it shared an IDE with a product called InterDev which was an, an inter attempt for enterprise developers to make web pages. And it made front page look like magic. So that didn't go well. They had incorporated COM into web pages through this thing called Active Server Pages. They only made three versions of it from 96 to 2000 before .NET comes along. But this is the point with Active Server Pages where Microsoft sort of rounded out their own stack, which to counter the term LAMP, they had WISA. I don't think is better. But that was Windows, IIS, SQL Server, and Active Server Pages, WISA. The rest of the web is just trying to make browsing better. We have a variety of web browsers at this point, IE and, and Netscape are still the big players for now. Uh, Opera's in, in play, and we're trying to come up with standards. So the first couple of versions of HTML were literally just built by the browser vendors with no plan, and they all did their own thing. But like the internet as a whole, which had a series of committees to try and make a plan for how these systems are all going to interoperate together, which makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about the infrastructure of the internet. When you want to, which essentially what you're doing is getting groups of IT people from universities together to agree upon standards for the kind of hardware they're going to use to interconnect all the universities. That's what the internet used to be. And so it was presumed, as we started thinking about what web standards should look like, we should constitute the same kind of committees. And this is where the W3C came from. We will sit down as a group of architects, we will make a plan, and then everybody will execute on the plan. Now, when you're about to spend millions of dollars on hardware, that plan's super important, everybody's very careful and they're diligent to stick to it, because if you do it wrong, you've wasted all that money. When it's just software developers, well, it's just not that kind of control. And so the W3C first formed around trying to develop the HTML3 specification. And they were following the same procedures that the internet, the IETF and others had done for other aspects of the internet. And so there were deadlines for submission of papers and so forth. And like software developers, they missed all of the deadlines. And so literally they had to throw away the 3.0 specification and start over. They came up with the 3.1 specification, but so many people missed that, that they actually skipped that one too. And so the next specification after HTML2 is 3.2, because numbers are hard. But 
was largely derived from what Netscape was currently doing, and they were already changing things fairly rapidly. And so the W3C had taken a lot of what Netscape was already doing and looking at the other pieces, and other browser folks were trying to be involved in that process. But by the end of 97, like the 3.2 spec only comes along, and by the way, this is a widget you were supposed to put on your web page, right, to let everybody know I'm 3.2 compliant. Uh, by the end of 97, they already have an HTML4 specification, and it has so many typos in it that by January uh, of 98, well, it's actually by April, we had 4.01. And the process in the year and a half to get to 4.01 was so traumatic, we basically freeze in place for the next like five years while they argue over other specifications. Now, after HTML5, we got better logos, right? And so somebody was smart enough, the HTML5 logo is really cool, they made the HTML4 logo, which if you look closely, has like the tables built in in the graphic, which I think is very clever. Although there's a far superior one, this is uh, from, from, by Maurice Melkers, which if you really care about these tags, you should always use this for HTML4. <laughs> that is a vastly more realistic branding of what HTML4 is really like. And so, by the spring of 98, we've got four sort of in place, and, and while the W3C goes through some machinations, and we'll talk about that, most of the interesting stuff that starts happening in the browsing world has to do with other related protocols, mostly CSS, that we start talking about. So, by the way, this is a great mug. We all need to own this mug. Give it to every web designer you've ever met. It's like, if you don't know that this is funny, you really don't work on the web very much. Okay. Uh, and also in 98, we get the next version of Studio, which is when Microsoft demonstrates their ability to use numbers by renumbering everything six. So there was a sixth version of VB and the sixth version of C++. It was the second version and last of Interdev, but they numbered it six. And the fourth version of J++, nominally 2.0, because numbers are hard, but they numbered it six. And it was also the last version of that as well, because, yeah. And this is around the time that a guy by the name of Scott Guthrie joins Microsoft. It's actually in late 97 right, that he comes directly out of university, at Duke University. And he works on that Studio 98 package. He actually works on the NT option pack, working on active server pages. And then pro and is basically pushed on this idea of how would you do this differently? And the apocryphal story, which I can confirm is essentially true, that over the Christmas break, where everybody else had taken off essentially for the month, he prototyped the next version of Active Server Pages, what they called ASP Plus at the time. And he believed in certain fundamental things about modularity and that the, the scripting language, the way that you would actually program it would be object-oriented. And he shows it off in January of 98 to the team, and the scripting language he's using is actually Java. This was the only object-oriented language that Microsoft had at the time. C Sharp is still like three years away. It'll eventually roll into that, but that's the beginnings of all of that. And it's the only job the guy's ever had. I think he's done fairly well. Uh, also in 98, Bill Gates uh, gets brought before a Senate Select Committee to discuss anti-competitive practices for Microsoft. If you choose to, you can go on YouTube and you can actually watch these things. Bill makes a terrible mistake here. He just essentially makes fun of these senators because they're not technical. And I'm pretty sure that Mark Zuckerberg was forced to watch all of these as a cautionary tale. Don't do this. Because this essentially sets up Bill for the, the, uh, the Department of Justice antitrust case for Microsoft. This is the beginning of that. But at the same time, our friends at Netscape, having IPO'd in 1995 with one of the fastest rising valuations of all time, by 98, so it's been three years, the stock price is below $20. So it's less than the original IPO price. And by October of 98, they will be acquired by AOL. I mean, you thought Adobe was where software went to die. <laughs> AOL. And of course, you know, AOL will to be acquired by Time Warner. And we've never heard from them again. I don't think any of us are unhappy. Uh, meantime, Microsoft continuing to build things. I mentioned IE5 for this reason. In March of 99, uh, when, I, when IE5 came out, it had a feature in it called XML HTTP. So the folks that were making the Exchange server had this idea that there should be a web client for browsing, web, browsing mail. And what they really wanted was to be able to say, you've got mail, that little pop-up 
that the, that the uh, AOL did. But it's web. And so essentially they walked across the campus to the IE guys and said, hey, here's an idea for an API that would allow us to basically you know, ping a request down to the browser. And it, using XML, because Tim Berners-Lee has convinced us that that's a good idea. And so the IE5 guys just implemented. No standards, never talked to the W3C, nothing, just implemented it. And it's the beginning of what we'd eventually call Ajax, right? Which, by the way, to this day, still not a ratified standard in W3C, even though everybody actually implements it the same way. It's just not a ratified specification. By 99, you get the busting bill, which is, and Microsoft has gone from the heights of the industry to this is the company now that's being broken up. They're actually or declared a pernicious monopoly in order to break into two companies, an operating system company and an everything else company. Uh, we know that doesn't actually happen. Uh, Bill steps down as CEO, Steve Ballmer takes over, and over the period of the next two years negotiates with the US Department of Justice to keep the company together in the form of a consent decree, which will be fine, signed in November of 2001. Lots of ramifications of that, but not particularly important from the web dev perspective, because a far more important thing is happening at the moment, XHTML. Yes, XML has taken us by storm, and we're trying to tighten up the way that browsers work. I mean, up until now, browsers have been incredibly permissive, and in fact, they still are today. But if you're thinking back in the 99, 2000 timeframe, we're having this conversation about how browsers have been iterating so rapidly, and so we've had this permissive model where it's like, if you recognize the tag, use the tag. You don't recognize the tag, just ignore the tag. No big deal. But programmers are getting upset with this. It's like, no, I, I think I'd like a little more rigor, a little more structure, a little more reliability. Or more importantly, architects are saying that. The kind of architects that sit on the W3C. And so XHTML was all about providing rigor and consistency to tags and to structure, some error handling, I mean, they were good intentions. It's just that nobody wanted to do it. And it didn't do anything about all the pages that were already out there. You know, the, the web was already the thing. So HTML, I mean, essentially, the XML 1.0 specification was HTML 4.01 with support for XML 1.0 spe specs in January of 2000. And we're going to chase our tail on this for a while before we finally move away from it. Everybody's favorite operating system shows up at about that time. We have fond memories of XP, just like we have fond memories of Dreamweaver. They're both delusions, right? The original version of XP, we call the Windows 2000 with the Fisher-Price interface. It didn't support USB. Uh, we, it had IE6 in it, right? And that's really the ultimate sin. I mean, the thing I understand about IE6 was Netscape had, impl had imploded. Right, I mean, Netscape was now gone, and, and they were sort of still, the, the ashes will rise in the form of the Mozilla Foundation, but that hasn't happened yet. So there's kind of only one browser team right now. And the, the W3C group had been going around in circles with stuff like CSS and X, H, XHTML for a while, and essentially the browser developers at Microsoft, they just cut a version. It's like, here, this is the version. We're timing this to be released with XP, so this is, we're done. This is as far as we're gonna go. So they implement a version of the CSS specification that's before the ratified CSS1 spec, so does it comply? And they add a bunch of their own features, and they've got X, XML, HTTP in it. It's not that this was a particularly bad browser for the time. What's evil is they don't make another one for six years. Right? They go off and they work on something else, something that will ultimately become XAML as part of Vista and Longhorn. Okay? That's where they went. That's what was actually going on. But at this particular moment, this is the browser. And then it's also XP because nobody wanted Vista, so this operating system sticks around for a long time and it default installs IE6. So that's why IE6 won't go away. We don't know this at the time. It's just like, hey, the next browser, the next operating system, keep on going. And in 2002, we get the first versions of .NET, and that's when uh, we start playing with ASP.NET and all of the, the potential around that. And of course, the vast majority of Microsoft developers are not web developers. They are WinForms developers. And so Microsoft builds a set of tools to allow WinForm developers with a minimum understanding of, of the web to build web pages in the form of ASP.NET web forms. And they work. They're just bad. They have consequences. Like, as long as nobody uses your app, it works great. As the number of users rises above, say, one, 
you have more problems. But it was the time. People have moved on, but at that time, that's where their developers were. The Mozilla Foundation, ultimately Firefox, appears by 2002. And this is the first significant browser since IE6. So it's been more than a year. Uh, and it, for devs especially, it takes off. This is the tool of choice. If you're a web developer, this is what you test a lot of stuff on. It'll reach to its peak in about 2009, and about a third of all browsing will be done by Firefox before Chrome comes along, so it eats the market. Um, the name Mozilla is the hybrid of Godzilla and Mosaic. Right? This was the monster that ate Mosaic. That's what Mozilla actually is. Apple enters this market in 2003 with Safari on the Mac. And we'll talk about that later. While we've been having good fun with the LAMP, WAMP, and MAMP stacks, uh, it's, it's David Heinemann Hansen that I think really changed the web more than anything. So DHH made a tool called Basecamp. In fact, he still makes a tool called Basecamp to this day. He's just one of those amazing people, the geek stuff that people use. I mean, essentially an email-based project management tool if you've never used Basecamp. And he did not like how difficult it was for his team to improve Basecamp. And he just started working on better tooling. Now, Ruby was an old language. It had been around for a long time. And it was a, it's a dynamic language. It's fun to code in, but it didn't do anything in particular. It was the Rails scaffolding that really was this transformative tool that allowed us to rapidly iterate to build web pages. Between the dynamicism of, of Ruby that made it super easy to code and the Rails ability to quickly map to data and render a bunch of information, you could iterate like wildfire. How good was Rails in 2000, by 2005? It was so good that Apple included it in their dev kits in Mac OS. And Apple hates everybody, but they included Ruby on Rails in 2007. And it was, this is where a lot of web developers went. Like you, this was a fun place to write code. In some ways, it had similarities to stuff like web forms. It generated pages really rapidly, but as the load and the scale went up on it, it struggled. Believe it or not, in those early days, the first versions of Amazon Web Services appeared. They, they have a couple of restarts, but 2006 was sort of their first go. Amazon was actually working on trying to build a better way for third parties to have storefronts in the Amazon site. And so they're trying to build a uniform infrastructure that people could basically consume on demand. They weren't setting out to create the cloud. They were trying to solve a problem for their set of customers. And so even though they had original prototypes back 2002, 2003, it's not until 2006 that they kind of restarted as, oh, we could sell this to almost anybody. And that's the beginning of the cloud. Microsoft does a conference called Mix in 2006. This is when they finally make a new browser. This is IE7. So the guys who'd all been, we, you know, it's, the timing's not accidental, right? This is 2006, so uh, Vista is done. That, that's gonna come out and have its own set of problems. And so those, those folks are, are, are freed up and they make a new browser, and, but also they start working, Microsoft starts in general starting taking, paying more attention to the open web. Up until now, they've been thinking totally internally, but when, I, when you look over the overarching story here, Mix, the Mix conference was them trying to embrace open web. It takes a few years for them to get it right, but they, they get started. And in the midst of all that, this stupid phone shows up. Now, now I was not a big fan of the phone. Phones were cool before the iPhone, right? In the old days, phones looked like something. They had keyboards, and they slid apart, and they had little knobby antennas and things like, but after the iPhone, everything's a slab of black glass. Now, admittedly, it was the perfect design. Right? It was the simplest thing. It, it, it's largely unchanged in, in 12 years. We've basically had slabs of black glass ever since. Maybe they're bigger, maybe they're smaller, maybe they have one camera, maybe they have two cameras, maybe there's a fingerprint on the back, on the front. Sometimes you hold it the wrong way. It's a slab of black glass. I would say in favor of it is the biggest thing that's happened in the intervening 12 years is it's gone from a luxury good for only the wealthiest people to four billion smartphones in the world. Pretty much every adult human has a smartphone now. We are all cyborgs. We have digital extensions to ourselves. It is a limb. The reaction when you lose it is pretty clear. It's, a, it's like, I lost my hand, all right? The, only, the problem is that most people think in terms of cyborgs like you know, stuff on the inside of your body. 
and so A, U, and B, messes with upgrades. So, but we've built this extension to ourselves. It's penetrated the vast majority of society. It, has these, it is the thing that's actually spread the internet to the bulk of the world. And when we look back on this in 100 years, this will be a profound moment. It doesn't feel that profound right now, but it is pretty important. Uh, Microsoft continues to try and improve their view of the web with their MVC product. This is also culturally a push to be an open source product from the very beginning. So Microsoft being the, host, the company hostile, Linux is a cancer, that whole thing. This product was built from the outset to be open source. They published the source code on CodePlex. I'm not saying it was good open source, because they were actually building it internally and just deploying versions of that code out to CodePlex. And they could, certainly couldn't take contributions or anything like that, but they were trying. And it was a better product in the point of view of modern development and, and how you'd actually render things. They will ultimately uh, release it in 2009 under a, the Microsoft Public License, or MSPL, which was not a good idea. It's basically the MIT license with the word Microsoft scratched in over top of it. They, since then, they have figured out, hey, just release it with the MIT license, it's easier. But not at that time. And it's not until then that we actually get to Chrome. So Google stayed out of the browser business for a really long time. Eric Schmidt, in his memoirs, talked about that he watched the early browser wars between Netscape and IE and, and, uh, and ultimately Mozilla and, and Opera and said, like, we don't want to be in that. But he ended up having a bunch of Mozilla employees at the company, and they kept building browsers in their spare time. This is back when Google had 20% time. And so by 2008, they had built in, in Google time, in their spare time, such a good browser, he's like, okay, ship it. So that's, I mean, that's where Chrome comes from. Is it, this is literally a side project. And then it, it'll, it'll consume the, the internet for the most part. Uh, but also 2008 is when we finally really get serious about killing off IE6, and I've worked hard to put together the chain of events that actually got IE6 out the door. And believe it or not, the first conversations, at least on the internet that I can find, about killing IE in a serious way come from DHH, the Basecamp slash Ruby on Rails guy. His, he's got a, he had a blog, still has a blog, on 37 Signals, where he sort of talks about what he's working on. And, and it's back in 2008 that he says, listen, we're at a point with Basecamp now where we're building web pages for the web and then another version for IE6. And it's just not worth it. This is an old browser. I mean, it's literally an eight-year-old browser. We need to stop this. So by the end of 2008, Basecamp won't run on IE6 anymore. That's his stat. I think it's like, you got to get off this darn browser. He extends it a couple of times because people are upset. But by early 2009, a group of newspapers that are publishing online in Norway all get together and go, you know what, you're right, I'm tired of doing this too. And they're, so they're the ones who first put up web pages where if you surf there with IE6, instead of showing you the news, it said, you need to get a better browser, here are some choices. And that really in the, in the February of 2009 is when we got, even Scott Hanselman did a blog post in February 2009 that says you really need to get rid of IE6. Like, because they're at IE8 as well. Like, you can move on, it's time. And so that's really the press that gets rid of IE6. It's literally this conscious effort to extinguish it. Now, I've hardly talked about Flash and ActiveScript as a, what we were all trying to find a better way to have smarter components on the client to be able to do better rendering, because HTML4 wasn't helping us. But it's around this time that, that Silverlight first appears. And a lot of people have fond memories of Silverlight that ends with a very big piece of pain. So, I mean, I would, I would convey to you trying to remember 2009 more than 2011 when you think of Silverlight. Because in 2009, we were in love. We had the MVVM pattern, and we had C Sharp and XAML, and it ran on the Mac. Which, if you really think about it, meant that they had a chunk of the .NET libraries that ran on the Mac which was weird, but you know, that's, that's where we got to. The first versions were mostly media players, actually the scripting language was JavaScript. They didn't introduce .NET with it until 2008. The V3 in 2009, that was sort of the breakout version. Uh, and in 2010, they pushed out a version uh, that worked with Chrome and also out of browser. So there was sort of this expanse all at once. And then the iPad comes out. The iPad comes out in, 
in April of 2010, and, it, and that's when Jobs put out this letter, thoughts on Flash. Now, the truth was, Flash murdered the battery of the iPad, right? And it really did. You could get a third-party browser installed and so forth and still run Flash on the iPad, and you could literally watch the battery go down. It was extraordinary. But the way that Jobs wrote that letter was he said, listen, plugins are a vector of malware. They circumvent the, the App Store and all the whitelisting. We're just not going to allow plugins in iOS anymore, which... The other plugin that was important there was Silverlight. Silverlight was a plugin. So at that point, Silverlight was screwed. It wasn't going to run on iOS, and there was not much that Microsoft could certainly do about it. Uh, a fine fellow by the name of Douglas Crockford publishes a book at the end of 2008 called JavaScript, The Good Parts, which at the time I remember looking at and going, there are good parts. Um, Doug Crockford, we've had on the show a couple of times, he's a lovely man, he's very, very intelligent. And what he was really saying was, this language doesn't inherently suck. Its relationship with browsers are the problem. And if we sorted these things out this way, you know, this could be a pretty good language. And while it may not have penetrated the market widely, it did resonate with, a, with some fairly important folks to this idea that we could make JavaScript better. That we're now living in this remarkable JavaScript world in 2019. But in 2008, JavaScript was this terrible you know, glued together scripting language. And this is the beginning of the rehabilitation of it. Uh, Microsoft puts out their cloud product to complete, compete with AWS. Initially, they call it Windows Azure. It will be renamed. It supports PHP, Java, and .NET out of the gate. We get the iPad, the big iPhone, and all of the consequences that that has. Studio 2010. Now, there's a bunch of cool stuff that comes to Studio 2010. This is when F Sharp first shows up. But I would argue the most important thing from folks who are working with Microsoft technology really need to care about about Studio 2010 historically is this is the version, the first time that Microsoft shipped an open source library in the box. It was jQuery. And it was because of MVC. So they, MVC had gone, they put out the V1 in 2009 as an open source release on Coplex. Now they were going to include it in the box. And they'd come to re recognize that there was a bunch of plumbing they needed around MVC to make it work well that looked a lot like jQuery. And rather than simply write their own, which was very much the normal Microsoft practice at that point, there was pressure internally to say, why not? We're just, we're recreating jQuery. Why don't we just use jQuery? Can we just use jQuery? Now, this was a hard doctrine for Microsoft to sort of get to the point of, can you, is this reasonable? Can we do this? That we'd include an open source library in it. And then they jumped through a bunch of hoops to try and make it right. At one point, they even considered actually putting a separate license on it. But they ultimately backed off on that. And so it wasn't only that they included jQuery in the box, but they also started contributing to the jQuery project. And they helped fund the jQuery Foundation. That, that foundation today is known as the JavaScript Foundation. And the reason for the foundation was that part of what Microsoft's concerns were is we're getting contributions from people that we don't directly control. And if they were to insert code that, ha code that has a legal liability, something like stolen code, we're exposing all of our customers. So let's create a foundation that says, this is where the legal liability for this product lives. And if something like this happens, this is where it will be fought. And we will hold the customers that are using it uh, safe from that. The Apache Foundation started this way as well, and now there's the .NET Foundation for the same reason. Right? These are the legal architectures we have to build in this modern world to protect these things. And so this is the hoops that they jumped through to make jQuery be what it was. John Resick started this back in 2002, but by 2010, it's a pretty mature product. And heck, you know, one would argue that they adopted it just to the point where the rest of us are like, why do you want to use jQuery? There's X way to go. Right? There was many other ways to solve this problem. But I also think that gives permission for larger companies to get involved in important JavaScript libraries. They're not just grassroots open source projects. And so the next one that pops up right in that same time frame is Angular. And this is a project that started out as an internal Google library. And uh, I've had good fortune to talk to folks like Brad Green who were involved in this project from the very beginning. And one of the points they made was they, of course, would have these internal company meetings where various teams building tools were essentially pitching to the rest of the company, hey, our tool is great. You should use it for your internal project. 
And it was a VP that sort of pushed back on them and said, if your product's so good, why is nobody outside of Google using it? And so part of the reason that they went public with it in 2010 was just sort of like, let's put it out to the rest of the world. We can make it even better. It is, you know, the first bits of, of Angular go all the way back to the first versions of Gmail in 2004. Like, it had been around for a while. But by 2010, it's quite a bit more evolved. And it's going to go through a whole bunch more evolution at the same time. So the tool for single page applications and uh, lots of folks on board with Angular these days. The tablet also introduces the complexity of what we'd eventually call responsive web design. Not that responsive web design didn't exist before that. Uh, I love archive.org, you ever spend a little time on that? One of the sites I'd highly recommend you going back and looking way back at is the Audi site. Audi has been building responsive web pages since the early aughts. So far back that most people just like, we were never even thinking of this. But before the tablet really became a product in 2010, we were pretty comfortable with the whole, you build a web page for a desktop machine and you build a web page for a mobile, right? M dots. Wasn't that big a deal. Then they introduced a third form factor. You're like, ah, crap. We're going to do T dots? So responsive web design was really, let's put in some tools, right? The, the, these um, media queries that allow us to more easily render pages in different sizes. So not only can you tolerate different sizes, but you can you know, customize your ugly. Whichever way you want to make it look. But media queries just open the door to make it a little bit more manageable. And it's even back in 2013 where they start talking about the year of responsive web design. Doesn't necessarily make it easy, but it's certainly a thing to work on. One of my favorite eras that I really got, you know, get excited about here, this is 20, late 2010, early 2011. And I think was largely catalyzed by that JavaScript, the good parts, was the duel between the various browser engine makers, V8, Chakra on the Microsoft side, Nitro. These were all different teams trying to make JavaScript better. And they, it, it was a, one of the better pieces of coopetition I've ever seen for a product that nobody can sell. And they were all trying to busily give it away, but they kept adding features to make JavaScript run faster, improve the net structure of the language, pre-compilation, utilization of the GPUs, and in the midst of all of this, you insert the conversation about HTML5. So the W3C had gone through plenty of convulsions at this point. XHTML has kind of fallen by the way wayside, but it was these, vendor, the, these various vendors building browsers all in touch with each other prone to sending cakes to each other to celebrate the new versions of the browsers they'd put out, that really started talking about, hey, I really like how this tag structure works, let's use this. And I think it changed the way they look at how they build new standards into browsers, that they stopped trying to write a specification and code to it, and rather experimented with code and showed it off to each other and then ratified something as a standard. And that really, HTML5 emerges from all this, but also the idea of JavaScript as a language independent of the browser. And Node had been around for a while at this point, but Node really takes off in 2009 with the V8 engine, which is such a better version of JavaScript. And there is a Chakra implementation of it as well. And of course, the cool part with this now is I have a programming language I can use both on the client and the server. So rather than having to deal with multiple languages, I'm working with all the same stuff. And especially on the server side now, I don't have to worry about what browser you have. I can use the latest version of JavaScript because I control what version I have. Bootstrap shows up in 2011, so the web developers just stop thinking about CSS. Just bootstrap it. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit more to it that, but I think that's funny. By 2012, Microsoft puts out TypeScript. And this, to me, was another interesting moment for Microsoft in the open source world. Because up until now, Microsoft had largely been a kind of an anathema to open source. Everyone was very careful around Microsoft. MVC had been living on Coplex, but they, you know, they really hadn't done much in the, in the way of GitHub, although they were starting to move in that direction. What was interesting to me about TypeScript was not so much, OK, this is, they were smart enough that it always compiled to JavaScript, and it was adding st static typing. And important people like Angular actually took it on. The more remarkable thing were the extension libraries built by third parties. 
And I think it has strong impact inside of Microsoft, where it's like, hey, we made an open source thing, and the community embraced it and ran with it and made it better. So we're not forcing ourselves onto the open source community as much as now the open source community is reacting to things that we build. I don't think VS Code could exist if what had happened with Tidescape hadn't happened first, that it sort of set the stage for we could make other things. And this is now towards the end of 2012, which means that Satya Nadella is on his way and the tone of Microsoft is about to change. And so when Satya comes on board, they rename Windows Azure to Microsoft Azure. It's not an obvious thing, but it's the beginning of Microsoft acknowledging that Windows is no longer the center of the company, that they're actually a cloud company, and that the products that help them make cloud work should be freely available, open source, as capable as possible. Now, HTML5 have been in works for quite a while at that point, but the specification actually gets ratified by 2014. So that sprint from about 2011 to 2014 in that, in that era, between all those browser vendors, ultimately comes up with these new logos. And of course, CSS is still awesome. VS Code in, uh, in 2015, taking the Electron engine and building the best editor they can. And again, I think it was the reaction of the open source community and how they worked with it that really took this product where it is. I mean, again, there's no money in this for Microsoft whatsoever, right? They're giving all this stuff away. And they've gradually, from 2014 onward, bit by bit, these dev teams, folks like Mads Torgensen, Steve Sanderson, you know, folks that are here, they're now doing all of their work in GitHub. They're doing their work in public. And everything is open source and, uh, and is web enabled as it possibly can be. Uh, Edge shows up with Windows 10 and nobody cares. Actually, this is now an interesting topic for just the recent announcements in the past few weeks, that they're now going to redo Edge with the Chromium engine in it. You've, you've heard about this? What does it mean? Like, first reaction is, well, why make it at all then? Just use Chrome. Well, a browser is more than a rendering engine. Chrome, you know, Chromium is just the rendering engine. And since it is an open source project, and Microsoft contributes to open source projects, it makes sense that they would just, rather than making another rendering engine, contribute to the engine that most people want to use. What I'm interested in is everything else that goes into a browser. What could Microsoft do differently around the wrapper, around Chromium, the tooling parts? But I think the biggest thing is just acknowledging that you know, a company like Google makes their living. They make that browser to collect your digital exhaust because they get to see where you go and what you do. Right? It's all the telemetry that comes out of it. You know, they, the old story now, and I think it's starting to resonate in our industry as a whole, is if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And so Chrome has been the telemetry on your behavior on the internet for a long time. And I wonder if Microsoft won't take this opportunity with building a new product around that same rendering engine to give us more visibility and perhaps even more control into that digital exhaust. What are we emitting out to the internet when we surf? It's speculation on my part. If I knew anything, I couldn't tell you. I don't know a thing. So, but I'm looking at it and going, why do this? And it, it makes the most sense to me. Microsoft does not make money off of collecting your digital exhaust. It's not their business. They sell cloud. But I'd be very interested in a browser that actually showed me what I was emitting, gave me more control over that information as a whole. We're also at a pivotal point with the way browsers look where we're starting to re-engineer those engines into, with progressive web apps, which is largely a Google technology, and also uh, and start to separate those concerns so that we can, well, really started with mobile. Can I tolerate being disconnected? Can I recover from that? Can I pop toast on you constantly? Can I forever ask you for your location? And can I send you notifications? Can I have 50 instances of Chrome start every time I boot machine? Can I have that? That's what PWA can do for you. And Microsoft releases .NET Core very rapidly, 2016, 2017, by the fall of 2017, they have the third version, which is number two, because numbers is hard. And then uh, I think one of the most profound things in, in mid-2017, our friend Steve Sanderson, who's around here somewhere, using the technology called WebAssembly, which comes out of the Mozilla Foundation, they're the guys who originally implemented it, which basically gives us an ability to insert code into the space where JavaScript lives. And he prototyped together 
a version of C Sharp that ran inside the browser. And that was in Oslo at the NDC conference. It was the first time he showed it in June of 2017. By February of 2018, last year, Microsoft turned it into an experimental project. They moved it from his open source repository to the ASP.NET open source repository. I, we did a show with them yesterday, which we'll publish in the next two weeks, where they're essentially saying this will become a product by the end of this year as part of .NET Core 3. And then I feel like we're at an entirely new phase as web developers now where the browser has become this platform for building any kind of software you want to build. Rather than having to install anything, you simply come in through the browser. Need an icon? Use the manifest in PWA. Use queuing from the PWAs. Want to program in your language of choice? WA does that. We're now at the beginning again. What did you want to do? We have all the doors open to us with a better language, with choices of languages and with a platform that gives us all of the capabilities we need. We just have to figure out what we want to make next. I'm excited. I think it's a great time to be a web developer. I hope we can shake off some of the baggage and scar tissue of this past 20 years, almost 30 years. If you think of 1989, it was that first web server in CERN. And look at the tapestry we have in front of us with this new set of tools, this new set of languages figure out what we want to make. I can't wait. Thank you. <laughs>